We welcome you to Clarendon United Methodist Church. We're so happy you've chosen to worship with us today. If you're joining us online, we'd like to invite you to like, comment, and share our streaming service today. You may also find links to mark your attendance and to our website for church happenings and where you may give your tithes and offerings online. If you're joining us in person, please find the pew pads at the end of your pews to help us collect the attendance while you're here. If you're new in church, following the service, our pastors will be at the sanctuary doors and would love to get to know you. After worship, drinks and other refreshments are served downstairs in Quarry Hall. We would love to connect with you. Now, let us join our hearts and minds together and invite God's Spirit as we worship.
Good morning. Please rise as you are able for the greeting. Jesus calls us from the distractions of our hurried lives, saying, come to me. Christ speaks to us in the comfort of our settled lives, saying, follow me. We are among those who have heard the call and have dared to respond to Jesus. We have been changed by his love and now desire to walk faithfully with our risen Lord and serve with him in the world. Let us worship God who has called us as his disciples. Let us pray. God of life, we gather this day with the victory bells of Easter still ringing in our ears. We come joyfully this day to celebrate your power, glory, your wisdom and might. May we remain faithful to your call to follow Jesus, secure in your promise that life will triumph over death that hope will triumph over despair, and that love will triumph over fear. We lift our grateful hearts to you. Amen. Please be seated. Buenos well, dias, as they say in Portuguese. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday worship at Clarendon United Methodist Church. We are a group of people who, because we love Jesus, we embrace all, we share Christ, and we serve others. If I have not met you yet, my name is Nilsi Furtado Gilliam, and I am the associate pastor of this lovely congregation, along with our lead pastor, the Reverend Tracy McNew Wines. If this is your first time here, we are honored that you chose to spend your Sunday morning worshiping, with, worshiping God with us. Tracy and I will treasure the opportunity to say hello to you at the door. We actually have a meet the pastors today right after the service in the praise room. God is 
<laughs> we'll, we'll get a story now. Thank you, team. Uh, so please feel free to join us to learn more about the church and how to get involved. So again, we're having a meet the pastors right after the service in the praise room. Oh, hello to you watching us online. Welcome home. We are so glad that you have joined us in this space. We are one family in Christ. So please take a moment to check in to let us know that you are here. We also would love to interact with you. So Fran is hosting our chat, so please say hello. Friends, I'd like to share that today, my father, uh, the Reverend Nelson Magalhães Furtado, and I will be serving communion to you, and he will be leading us in the great Thanksgiving prayer in Portuguese, and we'll be responding in English. I'll be giving you a nod when it's time to respond, so don't worry. And his church is actually watching the service right now. They just finished their morning worship, and they're now in our live stream. So, friends, do you mind if we say hello to our sister church? Uh, I'm going to say hello to them in Portuguese, and would you please turn to that side camera right there, the one that has a light on, and, and wave. So, olá, irmãos e irmãs da querida Igreja Metodista Central de São Gonçalo. Um abraço forte da irmã metodista em Clarendon, na cidade de Arlington, do estado da Virgínia, às cinco milhas da capital de Washington. Que Deus abençoe vocês. Thank you, friends. Thanks for waving. <laughs> so, tonight, at 7 p.m., we'll have a hymn sing right here in the sanctuary. We'll grab our hymnals and make a joyful noise into the Lord. So we would like to see you all there. Please check the announcements uh, with, de with details about the celebration of life for our dear sister Trudy happening next Saturday at 11 a.m. A life group start this week, so please take time to sign up online or at the door. Just let us know when you are available and we'll match you with a group. We are looking forward to uh, starting another session of life groups again. It's a great way to meet people, great way to meet friends you didn't know you go to church with because you we went to different services, so it's a great way to interact. Please sign up. Uh, yesterday, we had a great munch in missions. Uh, we had a great turnout of women from our church and from the community. So thank you so much to Mary Dodson and the leadership team of the United Women of Faith. Thank you to all who volunteered to make that event so special. Children, please come up and sit on the front steps to hear a special message. So what I want you to do is say, I love you. And Naya is going to start in Portuguese. Eu amo você. Eu amo você. Her grandmother recognizes. How about you? Yo quiero mucho. Yo quiero mucho. Is that in Spanish? Okay. Anybody else have any other languages? Eu amo você. Oh, same thing with Naya. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we're going to talk about I love you. And I have a few examples. Te amo. Te amo. What does that mean? I think that's in Italian. How about je t'aime? Oh, that's French. Okay. How about this one? Oh, this is Chinese. And I have to admit, I don't know how to say that. I have some good friends who would help me, but they're not here today. So how about sign language? How many of you know sign language for I love you? Is that? Yeah, very good, Naya. It's this way. Can everybody put their hands like this? It's a little hard at first, but yeah, that means I love you in sign language. You can tell all the people out there we love them. So the story today, there's a story from the Bible, and it talks about Jesus telling one of his disciples, asking him a question. And he asked Peter, this was after he had died, after he was resurrected, he came back and he met with the disciples several times. This was the third time he met with them. And he's cooking their dinner, Give, you know, he's cooking fish on the shore, and he says to Peter, so Peter, do you love me? What do you think Peter said? He said, yes, Lord, of course I love you. And, and then Jesus said, well, then feed my sheep. 
feed my sheep? What the heck is that about? Second time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And he said, take care of my lambs. And then finally, he says, the third time, he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you've asked me this. I, I would do anything. I love you, yes. And he said, again, he said, feed my sheep. And do you think Jesus actually had any sheep, like bad sheep? No. He was talking about the people. He was talking about you. He was talking about everybody. Because Jesus is Lord of all. So he wanted Peter to take care of all the people, all the poor people, all the sick people. He wanted him to take care of them. So, you know, sometimes it's easy to say, I love you, but it's harder to show it, right? Sometimes it's hard to show people that you love them. It's easy to say the words, but to do things, uh, that takes a little bit more effort. You going to say something, Naya? It's easy for me to show love. It's easy for you to show love? What ways do you show love? Hugs. Okay, that's a good way. Okay, so we just need to think about that. If showing love to other people, maybe somebody you know who's sad, you can show them love. You can listen to them. Or somebody who's hurt, maybe at school, you can be kind to them. Maybe who's somebody who doesn't have a lot of friends or is new. That's a great way to show love. So let's bow our heads. Jesus, we love you so much. We love you so much. Help us to show out love for you and to your sheep, to all those who need your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you met my friend? Let me introduce you to this friend of mine. Of all the friends you'll ever have, he's one of a kind. When you're lost and feeling all alone, he'll show you the way. Just open up your heart to him. Become friends today. Have you met my friend? He's been faithful since time began. He'll be there when you've reached your hopes in. Have you met my friend? If you need someone to talk to, he will lend an ear. He'll listen to your problems and dry your every tear. When it seems that no one loves you, life's more than you can bear. And he'll everyone doubt your friend, my friend will be there. Have you met my friend? He's been faithful since time began. He'll be there when you've reached your hopes in. Have you met my friend? This friend that I've been speaking of died upon the cross. The blood he shed for you and me paid the awful cost. So why not kneel and pray to him and let him save your soul and tell everyone about your friend everywhere you go. Have you met my friend? He's been faithful since time began. He'll be there your hopes in have you met my friend he'll be there when you've reached your hopes in have you met my friend a reading from the gospel of john chapter 2 Chapter 21, pardon me. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, 
and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when we were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Don't you just love the awkward moments of our lives? Those moments when you do something that makes your skin crawl with embarrassment when you blush and you want to slink out of the room never to be heard from again. Oh, come on, you know those moments. Surely I'm not the only one who's had them. I see a few smiles out there, maybe a few knowing smiles, not smiles knowing about my embarrassments, but about your own. Please, God, let them know their own embarrassing moments. I've certainly had my share. Like the one a few weeks ago, when I walked up to someone in church who I didn't recognize, and I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Tracy, I said in my very friendliest voice. And they introduced themselves to me, and I realized they were someone who's been coming here for months, and they were about to join the church. <laughs> they had their mask off for the first time. I had no idea who they were with their mask off. Please tell me I'm not the only one who has had that experience as well. Oh, blush, skin crawl, wanting to slink out of the room. But I stayed and said, oh, I just did that thing, didn't I? Embarrassing moments. I am so grateful to know that there are embarrassing moments, awkward moments, all through the Bible. It's like a biblical thing, this thing that you and I do. Thank you, God, for giving us an understanding that, wow, we can all embarrass ourselves. And it's as old as the human race. And it's something we're likely to continue doing in our lives. Sometimes it's something fairly simple, like not recognizing someone with their, someone with their mask off. But oh, sometimes it is much, much more than that. But, but the Bible helps us. It gives us stories like 
Adam and Eve, introducing the concept of awkwardness in the Bible as the archetypal, archetypal first man and first woman. They help us to understand just what awkwardness looks like in the Bible. As the story goes, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and suddenly they knew a lot of things, like the fact that they were, no lo- they were not clothed at all. They had nothing on. Now, God had told them that the one thing they weren't supposed to do was eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and taking just a bite of that fruit brought them to the realization of their nakedness. Awkward, awkward. And so they found a way, we understand, imagine, to clothe themselves. But then something even worse occurs. They meet God in the garden. And as they try to cover up their nakedness, they suddenly realize that God knows that they know that they are naked. They have been busted. They have been understood to have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Awkward. There are plenty of other stories that'll make you squirm in the Bible. Jacob marrying the wrong wife. Oh, that's a good one. Or how about the time when the prophet Balaam is corrected by his own donkey? Seems like a story more out of Shrek than out of the Bible, wouldn't you say? Well, today's passage from John's Gospel is right up there with the best of the awkward passages of the Bible. It is cringeworthy to the extreme. It's a story about Peter the disciple of Jesus, who of course would later become the top leader of the early church. Indeed, the, the, uh, the papal seat is the see of Peter. You know, Peter is like the man later in the church. He does great things with his life and his ministry, but you would sure never know it from his early days as a follower of Jesus, as one of those original disciples. Our story today comes right after last week's story, the story of the first appearance of, appearances of Jesus to his disciples in John after Easter morning. So we have the Easter morning great revelation that the tomb is empty and that our Savior is risen from the dead. And then last week we learned about that room apart where the disciples gathered in fear and in trembling because of all the events of Easter and their own fear for their lives and fear and wonder about what had happened, this mystical, strange, incomprehensible experience and new awareness of who Jesus was or is. And then Thomas finally comes to belief along with the rest of the disciples and confesses, my Lord and my God, a great resurrection, post-resurrection experience, one of the Easter stories in John's gospel. And then the gospel comes to what seems like it's close, saying these and many other stories happened in John's gospel so that you may have life, so that by reading them you may have life abundant. But then we come to chapter 21, which is tacked on at the end and which has its own little ending. And so it's understood by many scholars that that this is an additional ending to John's gospel, perhaps brought in to make Peter the big character. Because, oh yeah, he's the big character in this story, isn't he? In this part of the story. To make him stand out so that it's, it's really easy to understand why he's the leader of the early church because of this dynamic that unfolds in today's text. It's setting him up as this key central figure, a guide for us as disciples in our own lives today. So we come upon this, this text in the 21st chapter of John, a text that that offers us a story that in all our awkwardness we can relate to all too well. Let me give you a little bit of background just for this particular story. Remember Good Friday. 
I hate to go back there after we've moved through it and come to the joy of Easter, but Good Friday is always with us, isn't it? That day when one of Jesus' disciples betrayed him for a bag of coins, when all of the disciples abandoned him and ran in fear as the soldiers came and took him away, and more to the point of our story, when Peter, one of his central disciples, standing by a charcoal fire, watching the trial of Jesus, where, where Peter, standing by that fire, which is only, a, a charcoal fire is only mentioned two places in the Bible, one in that story on Good Friday, and one in our story today. Peter, standing by that charcoal fire on Good Friday, watching Jesus on trial, denies him three times. And what happens after that? The cock crows, just as Jesus had said. Now, in Luke's gospel, it, it makes my hand, my hair is actually standing on end because I'm thinking about Luke's gospel. It causes that effect in me because in Luke's gospel, it says that the moment the cock crow, Jesus over there, preoccupied with his trial, hears the cock crow and turns and across the crowd looks at Peter and catches his eye. It's not enough to say awkward. What a horrifying moment in Peter's life. What a horrifying realization that he is such a failure as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, this one whom he loves with his whole self. Peter just blows it, and Luke's gospel knows how to make it clear. <laughs> that one piercing moment when, when Jesus looks across the crowd as the cock crows and catches his eye. Oh. So now we find ourselves after Easter. The story is so different. The, the clouds have lifted, and, and the bright sunshine is upon them. We have this experience of, of Peter and the disciples, and, and what are they doing with this new realization that Jesus is not dead, buried in a grave, but he is their risen Lord. What are they doing as followers of this risen Messiah now that that reality has been made clear to them? What are they doing? They've gone back to the old normal. They just get in a boat and start fishing again. They just don't know what to do with life, with this new reality. Living under a new normal isn't something they can figure out how to do. So they go back to the old normal. <laughs> don't we wish we could do more of that right about now? I don't know. But, but they were able to. They could just get in a boat and start fishing. That's what they did before. So there they are out by the, out by the in the sea on the sea, having a very unsuccessful night, and, and this figure from the shore encourages them to put their nets on the other side. You can imagine what they thought of that. Yeah, right, whatever. <laughs> How's that going to help? But they do it anyway, and all of the sudden, the fish are too many to count. It's just, it's just so much. It's so heavy, this load of fish that they catch, and Peter realizes that's not just some figure by the shore. This is Jesus, his Lord, risen from the dead. And, and he go, gets into the water, covers his own nakedness, gets into the water, and swims to shore, where Jesus is standing by another blasted charcoal fire. Whew. The scene is revisited. And yet Peter comes up and the disciples follow him and finally get to shore with that load of fish. And, and Jesus is cooking breakfast for them. And, and they share some of the fish and the, the bread, which is all becoming kind of reminiscent of other stories of their past with Jesus, of eating with him and breaking bread 
with him and his power shown in those ways, those times. And then Jesus begins to talk with him, and particularly with Peter. And, and there's some question, the Bible doesn't make it really clear whether Jesus pulls Peter apart to talk to him, have this dialogue in our text, or whether it's out there with everybody. Since it doesn't say it pull, he pulls Peter away, I kind of assume they were all there together in that moment that becomes all the more awkward because everybody's listening in. It becomes a real teaching moment for these disciples, doesn't it? Jesus turns to Peter and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Oh, well, first time around, first time he asks that question, it's fine for Peter. Sure. Oh, Jesus, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, says Jesus. And Simon's like, okay, good, I can do that whatever that really means. Okay, I, I get it. And then Jesus follows, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. You know I love you. Tend my sheep. Simon, do you love me? And we can imagine him realizing this is matching that old story, that Good Friday just a few days ago. This is starting to feel uncomfortable. Jesus, why are you asking me a third time by this charcoal fire? Do I love you? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep says Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, you notice what I'm doing here? I reject you, you betray, you denier, you who turned away from me, I reject you. No. Each time Jesus points out that failing moment of Peter, that moment when he turns away and denies Jesus on Good Friday, he, he reminds him of that piercing, painful, far more than awkward moment. And each time Jesus follows it by calling him to further discipleship. Right in that place, I acknowledge who you are. I see you, Peter. I know you, Peter. I know you fail and stumble and fall, but I know you love me. And I'm going to make you say it so you know it too and you remember it. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then be my disciple. Follow me. Go out there in the world, you exactly as you are, frail, stumbling follower of me. Serve in my name. <laughs> wow. I don't know about you, I feel met. I feel met in that story. In all the places throughout my journey where I have stumbled, or like Thomas, I have doubted, or, or any of the, the places where I don't rise to the occasion at its fullest of following Jesus. Still, I have the chance to hear those words, feed my sheep, follow me. And Peter does it. He gets up and he takes another step forward and he follows Jesus all the way we understand it from this story, all the way to his death for Jesus and for the grace of God in Christ to be embraced by the world God loves. Jesus pushes Peter to an extraordinarily awkward, cringeworthy expression of his deep love. But it's a true expression of his love as evidenced by this life that was lived out in faithfulness, this life where he became the leader of the early church. 
and created a covenant community of faith that has pa been passed down through all these generations to us today. The work he did was excellent. I bet he still stumbled and fell. He and Paul disagreed on things. I mean, you know, they were people. They did their best. But that love was true. It was an awkward journey being a disciple, trying to figure out how to make the church work, how to make it last, how to make that covenant strong, how to change people's lives. It, it, it wasn't all smooth sailing. But it was the truth of their hearts being lived out. It was their love, their true love of Jesus being expressed. And so they have passed the church down to us. It worked. What we do out of deep love for Jesus matters. Our expressions of love for Jesus are no less awkward. <laughs> Jesus catches us in our frailties and failings just as Jesus caught Peter. Busted. We struggle to be fully faithful as disciples of Jesus Christ. But you know, our love is no less true. Our lives are changed by Christ. Let me tell you about one whose life was changed by Christ. You may not be surprised that I'm going to lift up our sister Trudy. Because I've talked about her a lot during my eight years here. What a model of faith for us all. Someone I've said many times, I want to be like Trudy Ensign. Trudy Brown Ensign. Trudy, who, who for 101 years lived out her faith in Jesus Christ. We're having her memorial service this Saturday morning, and it is so great to lift up this example of one whose life was deeply affected by her love for Jesus. She committed herself to the church, to serving Christ, in kind of a dazzling array of ways. So many different ways she served. When I came here as pastor, she had been a leader in the congregation for many decades. Indeed, at the time I came, I saw her at work everywhere. She just popped up all over the place in my life in ministry. She supported me as a pastor in ways I've never had anyone in 30-plus years of ministry show up. It has been amazing. You've got to come to the funeral, the memorial service, to hear more about that, to hear more details. But at the time I came, she was the church's membership secretary, helping all of our newcomers to become fully integrated into the life of the church. And as such, she almost unfailingly sat in the very back pew of the church at both services, the 8.30 and the 10 o'clock. She was there for both services, and she would sit there in order to gain a commanding view of the room. She wanted to have the ushers, and always did have the ushers, pass the pew pad sheets where people wrote their names in and hopefully guests would say, you know, this is my name. And she would have them all passed by the ushers back to her so that two-thirds of the way through the service after the offering, she could sit there and look and say, okay, this guest is right about there, and this guest, okay, that must be where they are. And then after the service, she would make sure she greeted them or at least somebody got to them to say, we're so glad you're here, just in case, so nobody would be missed. She wanted to be sure everyone knew they were so welcome to be here, and she was committed to it, both services. Trudy would join with me every single time I met with newcomers. In fact, she would arrange the meetings and set up where we were going to meet. She would sit there and kind of be right behind them so she could take notes because she wanted to remember what they liked, what they did, who they were, how many kids there, had, there were, the whole thing. And then she would come to the nominating committee meetings the endless nominating committee meetings in order to say, you know, I think this is a place where this new person in the church could fit in. She just really was passionate about making sure that everybody felt the welcome 
that was there for them, really knew that they were an important part of our life together. Plus, Trudy folded and stuffed the bulletins each week along with a cadre of dedicated volunteers and they had the time of their lives. It was so much fun to sit with them whenever I had the opportunity. And then she'd be sure to come in every Saturday and set up the coffee for our coffee hour on Sunday. Like for years and years and years, everybody just kind of knew, oh no, Trudy does that. I mean, those are just some examples. Just her life was, was all about kind of mothering this church, loving on us. But isn't that really loving on Jesus? Did I mention that when I arrived here at the church, she was already doing all these things well into her 90s? Still a key leader who changed who we were as a congregation. Trudy was one of those people who lived out her love for others by helping them, doing caring things for them. And so, of course, that's what she did to express her love for Jesus. She served, and she served, and she served. And I just frankly want to be just like her. I imagine that like Thomas, she probably had some moments of doubt. We all do. Like Peter, I imagine she sometimes stumbled in her walk of faith, because we all do. Maybe she didn't do it quite as publicly as Peter did by that charcoal fire on Good Friday. Maybe it wasn't pointed out as often, like poor Peter by that charcoal fire and the post-resurrection experience with Jesus. But like Peter and Thomas and a whole host of other biblical witnesses, and like you and me, Trudy's truest self was the self that loved and served her Lord. Her truest self followed Jesus. This is the reality for all of us, that at our best, in the deepest and most earnest places in our hearts, our truest selves love Jesus. Like Peter, when all is said and done, we will follow him with our lives. I love the way Professor Jamie Clark Souls puts it. The beauty of signing on with Christ, among other things, is this. You get to be you. And you being you brings the creator of this universe, of all universes, deep delight you learn that nothing you have done makes your life and your future irredeemable. Repeatedly, Peter denies Jesus, willingly and willfully alienates himself from the one who loves and knows him best. Not once, but repeatedly. Peter denies and rejects love, faith, God, loyalty, friendship, and hope and is complicit in the death of an innocent man. So sure, you and I have done and said some things that we wish we hadn't. And you and I fully believe in Easter morning, but, but cry over the personal Good Fridays we confront after Easter Sunday. We fall back into our old patterns, the old normal. But always, always, Jesus comes, looks into our eyes and our very souls, and asks us questions that seem so obvious or maybe painful or offensive at first blush, like in our story today, but turn out to be the only questions that matter. Do you love me? And as we answer, we move beyond rote response to something like wonder and comprehension, like transformation, and we're never the same. Our truest selves live the love of Jesus Christ. Our truest selves are forgiven and freed to serve. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, the rush and celebration of Easter is over. 
the excitement which carried us to Easter and to the room where Jesus appeared to the disciples is starting to wear off. We just aren't sure what to do now that the journey to the cross is completed. Help us to understand that the cross is not our ending point, but rather the pivotal point. Help us to be people of astounding faith who have seen the light of resurrection, who know that you have conquered death. Fear cannot claim and bind us. You have released us to serve others and witness to the glorious good news. There are so many who need to feel the rejuvenating power of your love in their lives. Those in the throes of war, food insecurity, broken relationships and illness, both mental and physical. Inspire us to move to compassionate action, bringing resurrection hope to your world. For we ask these things in the name of our risen Lord. Amen. Friends, now that we have heard from God, it is our time to respond. One of the ways we reply is by giving out of our financial resources. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary of doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. A harvest for us is to see lives that have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now we invite you to prepare your offering envelopes and your online giving as we watch this video. systemic poverty here in our community. We cannot do our programs without you. So enjoy this great morning.
shadows of this life have grown out fly away like a bird from prison bars has flown I'll fly away I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away in the morning when I Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away, I'll fly away to a land where joys will never end. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away in the morning when I A graça do Senhor Jesus, May the grace of our Lord Jesus, o amor de Deus o Pai, the love of God the Father, a doce unção do Espírito Santo, and the sweet consolations of the Holy Spirit, seja com todos vocês, be with all of you, não somente hoje, not only today, mas por todo sempre, but forever. Amém. 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 Just a few more.